Now, so I'm going to be presenting two arguments for why I think, um, why I think atheism is true. For my first argument, the existence of the universe. I actually think that the very existence of the universe is a logical problem for God. I'm willing to bet that nobody here seriously doubts that the universe exists. Right? The reality of the universe and the objects within it are just too obvious to deny. I'm also willing to bet that the theists in this room believe that God is maximally great. He's, he's a maximally great being. Uh, he's absolutely perfect, both morally and ontologically. So what is meant by this? What is meant by ontological perfection? Well, there are things called great-making properties. Uh, theologians have identified these, and they, they call them, uh, them great-making properties, things like power, uh, having knowledge, being loving. Uh, and God, if he exists, is a maximally great being uh, in that he has all of these properties to their maximal degrees. As in, there couldn't be a being that is more loving than God because God is maximally loving. Uh, the words of Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland can help shed some light on this. Uh, J.P. says, to say that God is perfect means that there's no possible world where he has his attributes to a greater degree. God is not the most loving being that happens to exist. Rather, God is the most loving being that could possibly exist. So that God's possessing the attribute of, of being loving is to a degree such that it is impossible to have it to a greater degree. So the question I want to ask us tonight is if the Christian God were to exist, would he have reasons to create the universe? Could he have reasons to create the universe? The theist, of course, only has one option here. He must answer yes because, well, after all, the theist does accept the existence of the universe. So he must say that if God exists, he would have reasons to create such a universe. Um, however, I want to argue that the answer to this question is actually no. That God, if he exists, would never actually create anything let alone an entire universe and populate it with the creatures that we find it to be populated with. The argument involves the term God world. No, this isn't a, a theme park. Um, <laughs> in the context of this argument, God world is a term that I, that I use to refer to that possible world where God exists alone and nothing else exists for eternity. So maybe you're wondering what I mean when I say possible worlds, right? Well, when I say that X is a possible world, all I mean is that X is a possible way that reality could have been. When I say that X is the actual world, I'm talking about how reality really is. So again, to say that God world is a possible world is only to say that um, it's, it's possible that God could have not created the universe. So I'm referring to that, that alternate reality where God never actually creates anything. So um, if you want to go to my first slide, and the next one, the... Uh, uh oh, how is everybody doing today? <laughs> okay, uh, I call this the cosmological argument for atheism. Uh, it reads like this, if the Christian God exists, then God world is the unique best possible world. Premise two, if God world is the unique best possible world, then the Christian God would maintain God world. Premise three, God world is false because the universe does exist. And conclusion, therefore, the Christian God as so defined does not exist. Now, this argument sure seems valid, uh, but is it sound? Are the premises true? Premise one, you know, if, if the Christian God exists, then God world is the unique best possible world. Why think that this premise should be true? Well, if God exists, remember, he's the best possible being, meaning that he has, he has all those great making properties to their maximal degree and no such properties to any lesser degree. Now, a world composed entirely of the single best possible being would be a world composed entirely of all those great making properties. The universe, or um, I'm sorry, the reality and God would just be identical. So the reality would be made up of these maximally great properties. Unless there is some independent source of goodness that exists outside of God, which I know my, my opponent rejects, and, and a lot of uh, theistic philosophers reject, um, and, unless there's some independent source of good, then God world must be the unique best possible world. You can't get a better situation than a world composed entirely of all those great making properties to their maximal degree, which is what God is. Um, so truly, this is, this is just the cat's pajamas of possible worlds. Now, premise two. If God world is a unique, best possible world, then the Christian God would maintain or preserve God world. 
Well, I think that this is true. Well, if God exists, then he is truly a maximally great being. He would be aware of the fact that himself existing alone uh, as God world is the greatest possible situation that could ever exist. A maximally great being, being wouldn't introduce uh, limited uh, entities uh, with limited degrees of, of great making properties like Genesis would claim, right? Uh, Genesis says that you know, God creates Adam and Eve, but Adam and Eve don't have knowledge to their maximal degrees. So right there you have God creating um, entities with properties that are less than perfect. So he's degrading the state of affairs. Um, and of course to suggest that God is in the degrading business is to suggest that he's not maximally great. Premise three, God world is false because the universe exists. This, is, this should be obvious enough. Uh, it's, it's not the case that the only thing that exists is God because you all exist, so unless you're Spinoza, uh, you should accept this premise. <laughs> so the conclusion, of course, is therefore that God, as so defined, doesn't exist. Now let's suppose that my opponent has a way out of this argument, right? Let us suppose that we're given a reason to doubt uh, my argument and to think that actually a maximally great being would have reasons to intentionally create uh, or to intentionally degrade the, uh, the world by creating non-God objects. Now if that's the case, then my, my opponent would need to deal with my second argument. Um, this one is not concerned with whether or not God would ever create a universe. Rather, this one is concerned with what kind of universe God would create if he indeed had reasons to create. And so for my second argument, the problem of evil. If I could bring up that slide, please. The existence of evil constitutes strong evidence for atheism. In Uganda, an organized gang of chimpanzees inflicts extreme violence on another lone chimp who has wandered into their territory. They close in with a screaming frenzy, biting, kicking, and inflicting powerful blows, causing horrific injury uh, to the immobilized chimp until at last nature shows a bit of sympathy and allows him to die after several minutes of pure, horrifyingly unimaginable torture. Now thanks to University of Michigan primate behavioral ecologist John Matini and his 10-year study of a chimp community in Uganda, we now have definitive evidence that bands of chimpanzees violently kill individuals from neighboring groups in order to expand their own territory and secure additional resources. Even isolated instances of cannibalism have been observed. Now, of course, there's very little difference between humans and chimpanzees and the other great apes. Chimpanzees, are our closest cousins, are highly intelligent social animals and are especially sensitive to physical and emotional pain. Like humans, they exhibit a, a range of emotions, including pleasure, deep depression, pain, empathy, and grief. Now, why would a loving God allow this example of horrific suffering to occur? In 1983, Charles Rothenberg kidnaps his six-year-old son David after losing a custody battle with his ex-wife. One night, while David slept, his father douses his body in kerosene. Now David has third-degree burns on 90% of his body. Why would a loving God allow this? Isn't the bystander who does nothing guilty of something? So if God is all knowing, he must know about the evils and the sufferings that exist in the world. So that can't be an excuse. He knows about them. If God is all powerful, then he could easily prevent these. <laughs> if God is all good, it sure seems that he would want to prevent them. Now most of you are going to be familiar with this classical problem of evil, right? Uh, this classical problem says that uh, the existence of any evil is logically incompatible with the existence of God. And so if you can show that logical incompatibility and you can argue that evil exists, then it would follow that God does not exist. But I want to give the Christian God a bit of a break here. I want to, be a bit, I want to present an argument that's a bit more sympathetic to the Christian God. After all, we do have a history, so I want to be a, you know, nice here. I'm perfectly willing to grant that God may have reasons for allowing certain evils or instances of suffering uh, to occur in the actual world. After all, it seems plausible to me that if God exists, God may have reasons for allowing some evils to ensure some greater good uh, or to avoid some greater evil. But, and this is important, God would never allow an evil or an instance of suffering unless it was logically necessary to obtain some greater good or to avoid some greater evil. Uh, that is to say that God would never allow any unnecessary evils, or as I will call them from now on, gratuitous evils. But many of these evils that we 
uh, observe in the world, many of these instances of suffering, seem like they have no justification in the form of some greater good or in the form of some greater evil that they could uh, avoid. Many of these kinds of evils seem like God could have easily prevented them without losing out on these things. And this is the case even when we think very deeply about these issues, right? They, they, some of these things just don't seem like they could have a possible justification. Now, I think that this fact should lead a rational person to say that probably some evils aren't just confusing, mysterious, or inscrutable, but that some evils or instances of suffering are actually gratuitous. Uh, instances of suffering that God would have prevented if he existed. And so to the degree that there are probably at least, or that there is probably at least one gratuitous evil, to that degree, God probably does not exist. So uh, the argument goes like this. Many evils, gratu or many evils and sufferings seem gratuitous, right? They seem that they have no justification. Uh, secondly, probably at least one evil or instances of suffering is gratuitous. Premise three, if God exists, he would not permit any gratuitous evils or sufferings. And then we, conclude, we can conclude from that that probably God does not exist. Now, a lot of you are going to be thinking, well, hold on there. Uh, you can't just go from the mere fact that uh, many evils seem gratuitous to the fact that probably at least, some, at least one evil is gratuitous. Uh, but I disagree. I mean, we make these kinds of inductive inferences all the time. And we feel that we're perfectly rational in doing so. Suppose that, you know, after rummaging around in my fridge, I can't seem to find a carton of milk, right? I look really hard and I can't seem to find a carton of milk. Uh, this is unfortunately a regular occurrence at my house, but, but naturally enough, I mean, I would infer that there probably isn't a carton of milk in my fridge. Nobody would say that that is irrational. In the same way, if some evils are such that uh, it's incredibly difficult to find even a possible justifying reason for God to permit them, then we have really good reasons to think that probably there is no reason for God to permit them. Probably these are gratuitous evils. And of course, if there, is, if there are probably gratuitous evils, then God probably does not exist uh, to that degree. Now the theist, of course, has options available to him. Um, one of them being that you know, he could deny my premise from one to two you know, and say that we're simply not in a good position to place probabilities on these things. Right? He could argue that our, uh, our cognitive situation, right? uh, our awareness of goods and evils that exist uh, is so, uh, so low compared to God's that, we couldn't really, that we're not really in a position to place probabilities on these things. Um, so remember my fridge analogy. Uh, the theist might say, well, this approach, um, this approach might say that we're, we're simply not warranted in concluding that, or I'm sorry, this approach would say that we are warranted in concluding that uh, there probably is no milk in the fridge, but that is only because we would expect to be able to see it because milk is of the size and, and of the, uh, you know, it, it appears a certain way that we would be very surprised if we didn't see it in the fridge, right? So if I open up the fridge, I should expect to be able to see it, and if I don't see it, then I can be in a position to, put, to place probabilities on the, on the idea that there probably isn't one there. Um, so it's all about the expectation one has. Now, of course, the theist, in, uh, by uh, parody, is going to say, uh, given our limited ability to see God's justifying reasons, we're simply not in a good position to say that they probably don't exist. Now, this view, I think, is just extraordinarily implausible. So let's think about what, what kinds of things that this would, would imply. Um, so if we're not in a position to, to understand or to... Um, to have knowledge about um, goods and evils, right? So let's, let's say that the theist is saying, look, we're, we're not in a position to think that our knowledge of the goods or our knowledge of the evils or the relationships between these things and, and events that happen in the real world, uh, that our knowledge is so little about these topics that we're not in a position to do that. So we can't really say whether God would be justified in allowing certain evils to occur. Now the problem with that, I think, is that the same thing could be said about God being deceptive. So it may be the case, let me put something out here, it may be the case that the Bible, uh, when it speaks of the uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for a person to be saved, right? it may be that God has um, put in the Bible these different necessary and sufficient conditions, but he's actually lying about them. right? 
uh, he has reasons that we don't understand because we're in such a limited uh, epistemic position compared to God's. Um, it might be that God has a reason, a, a morally justifiable reason for lying to us. And just simply because we can't see that reason doesn't mean that we should say that probably one doesn't exist. So, of course, we could say, well, God is good. He wouldn't lie to us. But, of course, you could say the same thing about God is good. He wouldn't allow uh, the father to torture his son, right? This goes both ways. So I could say, well, if we're not in that position to place probabilities on that, we're not in a position to place probabilities on whether or not God is lying to us about the means of salvation, about... Uh, the nature of God, and um, about whether actually Jesus rose from the dead, right? Because the only um, uh, evidence we have of that is in the Bible, right? These, this is, these are the claims, these narratives. Um, perhaps God inspired all these lies because he wants you to believe certain propositional knowledge about the world, even if it's false, because for some reason beyond our understanding, our beliefs in that are required for some greater good that we don't know of. So. So what this does, of course, is it, is it says that Christians can't actually know that these things are true. They just know that they should believe them. So I think that this kind of response to the problem of evil, uh, this kind of epistemic humility, is very damaging to actually Christian belief. So if you take that response to the problem of evil, then you abandon your knowledge of Christian belief. And um, so as to the status of God in the 20th century, 21st century, um, I don't think it's very good. Um, Obviously, belief in God is, is, uh, is rather popular, but as to the rationality of these beliefs, I don't think that they, uh, that they can hold weight. I don't, I mean, people are going to believe and they're going to, um, you know, they may or not, may not have good reasons. I don't, I don't know of any actually good reasons to believe in a God. And so um, I submit to you that you're not rational in believing in one. Thank you.